you're doing something and treating it like a hobby, you should only expect hobby results. I want to be really good at this. I'm excited about this. It's not just a hobby. So when people call things a side hustle and a hobby, you're just basically giving yourself permission to not go all in. And I don't like that at all. That's how most people are. The vast majority of people will go really hard for that two months and then there'll be a flash in the pan. They disappear. Next time you see them months down the road, they're handing you some other type of business card and telling about the newest thing that they're into. It's very common to hear the phrase, follow your passion. But is that really the right way to describe what I do? And the answer is no. I think you got to follow your character. And I think where the mistake is, most people follow a profession based on their passion, but not understanding that their character, the thing that drives them, could be applied to any career path. So let's talk turning passion into a career. Obviously, you started your career as an engineer. You worked yourself through university seven years, be able to get through to become a professional engineer. But then at a certain point, you decide, hey, auto racing. Let's put the donkey back before the cart here, okay? Because I actually pursued the mechanical engineering degree with the purpose and the intention to go into the automotive industry because I said, hey, I like cars. I like to build and race cars. So there's got to be some kind of a six-figure degree plan that I could get that would give me a potential odds to go do that. So they said, hey, that's mechanical engineering. Okay, cool. I'm not really good at math, but I'll go figure that out, right? And what happened is as I was graduating school, it was about a year left of school and I had maybe two courses left. I started doing these interview processes and talking to the big three suppliers and big three themselves up in Detroit. And I'm in Houston. And the salary offers they were sending across the, the, the phone line, so to speak, weren't really that interesting to me. They were like in the low 30,000 range at that point. I mean, this was late 90s. And I was like, man, that's pretty low. Was like, at that point, I was working construction and I was waiting tables and also managing a restaurant part-time. I was like, I already make that as a waiter. Like, why, why would I move to Detroit, which is not even nearly as cool as Houston? Sorry, you Detroit people, but it's true. And go take this pay cut to go work on these cars. So I started talking to oil companies in the Houston area. And the salaries were much higher. Back then, it was like forty five dollars to 50000 I was like, wait a minute. I could actually stay in my home city, make enough money to be able to afford the cars I would go be working on and actually enjoy those? Like, that's a no-brainer. I'll just stay here in Houston, make that salary. And I actually bought my very first, I bought a Trans Am when I graduated. See, I bought a Trans Am. So What year? That was a 98, right when I graduated. So yeah. It's, it's a means to think about that. It's like, okay, we put our passions first. We do some actions. Like I got that degree because of that. But then you get to a crossroads and you and I had this brilliant conversation yesterday about decisions and they're not final. Well, I thought I was going to that journey and then it just, it wasn't a good decision for me at that time. I'd rather just save money, lived here, safer place, better weather conditions, be able to enjoy the things that I wanted instead of working for the things that I was working on. And so did that's you, what pushed did, me. Did you well. ever did you ever regret that decision? Because so many times we do that. We we go to school or we go down a career path because we we believe we want it and it requires a sacrifice. I went to film school and I wanted to then work in kind of documentary storytelling and in television. And at a certain point I found myself working in A V. Now you know, anyone who is not within, uh, uh, let's say, a creative industry or a live event industry or whatever might say, well, film school, you're, you're telling stories and you're making films and live events or AV, you're just, you know, using the same equipment in a live thing. But, but it's not the same thing at all, right? It, was, it wasn't the same thing. And I actually had to go from making, I was making 36000 a year. The offer I got to go back into creating film stuff was 28000 a year. And I thought, I'm not going to do that. And I told them, I won't, I won't work for less than $30,000. And they said, okay, we'll pay you $30,000. But at the time, it was still like, looking back, it seems like a no-brainer to me to take a pay cut to pursue the actual field I want to be in. To me, it seems like a no-brainer to you to, I mean, I'm sorry, Detroit as well, <laughs> but, but not as good of climate, maybe not as cool of area, maybe, you know, what have you. But do you kind of regret that decision at any point in terms of why didn't you pursue that career? Who knows where it would have taken you? I think I would have had a lot more passion in my career. If we were talking about the oil and gas versus automotive, I would definitely would have had more enjoyment for the content and the things that I was creating on that side. But at the end of the day, it's our lifestyles would have been so much drastically apart. I mean, 
to give you an idea, within the first three years of oil and gas here in Houston, I was already making six figures. And I've known engineers, I have good friends that work for GM and Chrysler and, and all these majors. Man, it took them 10 years to get to that point. So just from the financial and the lifestyle advantages I gained from just being in oil and being highly compensated to go do these things, I don't have any regrets in that regard, but I've always had that itch to scratch. I was always looking outside. And that's one thing I want to really hit the listeners on because you may be in a profession right now. You may be doing something that you're really good at and you're highly compensated at. You're very proficient. You may even be known as a renowned expert or authority in that subject, but you know what? You may not love it. You may not really enjoy it, but you may just do it. You may like looking at the and hanging out with the people that you work with. Maybe the team is the compelling thing that gets you to the door every day. But I see so many times people work 20, 30, 35, 40 years of their lives, and they don't really feel like they're in the source of the right direction. They just feel like there's something that was just not aligned with what they're doing for who they truly are. And a lot of times we don't discover who we truly are until later in our life. And you realize that when it comes down to it is they were trying to fulfill somebody else's dream for them, not their own. It was their parents' dream, or maybe their grandfather was a lawyer, their dad was a lawyer, so they had to be a lawyer or a doctor or whatever, insert the career profession there. So there's a sense of shame or guilt because maybe grandfather had to work so hard to come over here and make this, and then you got to take over the family business because it's just the way you do it. And guys, you can be highly compensated and good at what you do, but you don't have to love what you do. And I that's tough, man. And we've seen people change because of that. There was this uh, corporate documentary that I saw. This is a little bit of a tangent, but mm-hmm. it was produced with Audi. We're talking about cars, right? It was produced mm-hmm. with Audi. And for one of these marketing experience things, they built, um, gosh, what are those? Do you remember when we were a kid, how you would put those little cars on the electric tracks and you would... Slot you would car. The, what, slot slot cars. car. So, so Audi commissioned a beautiful realistic slot car track that was controlled by iPads where you had cameras on it and all this stuff. And But the person who built it, the person who they commissioned it from, they created this backstory. And what had happened is in 2008, 2009, he realizes he's, he's in corporate marketing and he hates his job and everything. But what he has this passion for is creating these miniature models and cities. And he decides to quit. And he's talking about the fact that if you use this type of branch and dip it in this way, it looks like trees. And just like, just if if I was friends with this man while he was transitioning, I would think he is bananas. And yet, when he is being featured by Audi building this beautiful thing, talking about the fact that you can create these little trees by dipping this stick in this white thing or whatever, he looks like the greatest genius in the world. Yeah. And so part of this is, I think where people are catching you in your transition. If you're just making the decision to transition, you're crazy. If you're mid-transition, doubt is all around you. And if you're on the other side of it, suddenly you're the genius. I know that you work with people and you're very good at reinventing yourself. You've reinvented yourself time and time and time again. How did you go about doing that and, and being able to not worry about being the crazy one or being the doubter in the middle. So you come out on the other side looking like you're just a genius. I don't know. I think it's has to do with some of what of my daredevil personality. I mean, I was always that kid that would put the extra brick under the bike ramp if my friends would dare me to do that. And I would just do it. And it was fun. And I've always been good at proving other people wrong when they say I couldn't do something. So I would say a lot of my success comes from, I bet you can't, or I bet you won't. Right. It's like, okay, watch me. So why, you know, why actually, is that? Where does that come from? I don't know, man. I think it's I think it's a character thing that we we sometimes have. You know, it's it's said, I bet you won't, I bet you won't. And being raised, I guess, around other people that had doubt in you, because I grew up lower middle class and there was a fluent, a lot of fluent people in my city, Friendswood, Texas. It's a suburb of Houston. And so I grew up at what we'd call around rich kids, and I never had any envy or things like that. I always wanted to learn from their fa- their parents and ask them questions. I'm always curious, you know, like, what do you do for a living? I would always ask these kind of questions. So I was that kid. And I just remember being counted out on some of the social circles because maybe my parents didn't earn enough income for me to be cool like them. Right. And so for me, there was like this internal fire that I've always had to be really competitive and try to win at things because I always felt like I was an underdog when I was a kid, but I never let the underdog or the past stories or 
growing up half Japanese in a largely Texan community, I never let it be an anchor or an excuse for me not to do it. I just actually used it as a fuel to push me forward because I was that, right? Because, oh, you want to count me out? Cool. I'm going to work extra hard to prove you wrong. And I'm going to get a better result at the same time. So that's just who I am. And I know that that's different. I know there's a lot of people out there just like me, but that's just who I am. So you mentioned growing up, your dad, a Marine, your mm-hmm. mom, Japanese, uh, who, who you said worked for her whole life as, I guess, a cafeteria lunch lady. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could kind of picture this middle class kind of environment, but family of origin is so much of, of who we are. And so what would be the difference between, say, what your dad, uh, you know, a Marine, and your mom, someone who grew up in Japanese culture, which, which I imagine has a lot to do with honor and respect mm-hmm. and being a woman as well. What were the differences between them? You touched on it there. The honor and respect and nature are big on the Japanese side. So when you talk about the Buddhism, you know, Baptist and Buddhism is a weird combination, but that's what I grew up. And although that we weren't highly religious, we were very spiritual because we always believe there's something bigger, right? And that's the Buddhism is always in touch with nature. And my mom is a, is a green thumb. She loves gardening and that's her hobby. Like you go to the backyard, the front yard, they always have like the the yard of the month or whatever, you know, that's just historically, we've always had that because that's what my mom loves doing is planting and nurturing plants and making them beautiful. Right. And she was always artistic. She's always creative and painting and building things. And she used to make our clothes because we couldn't afford clothes. So we would go to the fabric store and buy fabric and the patterns. And for the first, I guess, eight years of school, probably when I got to like later in junior high, when it wasn't cool anymore to wear your mom's clothes, she she could make really nice clothes, but it wasn't brand names. So you start to do these things, try to fit in and you start to try to buy brand names to fit in with your friends. You feel like you're outcast. So creative mom was very creative, very demanding on the education. Like if I got an A minus, that was kind of, you might as well fail, right? So I was a straight A student and here's where it gets really disciplinary and on the education. I didn't miss a single day of school from graduation to kindergarten. Like I didn't miss one day. She basically said, if, if your ass isn't dying, you're, you're getting on that bus. Like you're going to get on that bus and you're going to go. And so there was no excuses. And I'll tell you that maybe the first few years, you're kind of like, this isn't cool because Billy over there, get, I see him skip all the time. And Tina, I let her mom lets her take Fridays off once in a while and go to the movies with her. And at first, you think that there's this, like, this isn't cool. My mom's really strict. But here's the thing that's funny about this. Once you make it a few years in and you get these perfect attendance awards and they say your name on it, it becomes your identity. And at that moment, you get to decide, do I want to keep this identity or do I want to shatter this identity? And does this serve me or is this kind of just you know something not worthwhile? And I said, well, if I could do it five, six years in a row, why not just keep doing it? So it became a personal identity thing to me, a character defining thing that I'm always going to show up and I don't care if I'm not feeling like it or not. I don't have any excuses. Just go. And that became part of me. And so that's that's the mom side, right? Dad side, all the, the mental discipline, the leadership. He's always been the leader of his friend circles. He's always been a leader in his his, his career was a sergeant in the military. After the military, he worked up through labor and working in chemical refineries. And he was always like the leader in the foreman, the general foreman, the superintendent, the plant manager. He kind of just climbed his way up from literally the bottom. And he always taught me the leadership and he told me to stand strong for the things I believe in. And I'll tell you that I was very fortunate to take judo when I was a kid. I look back at where I'm, most people see me, they think I'm very calm and I'm very collected and I'm kind of like that silent assassin type. And where did that come from? Because I remember being more physical and, and like a daredevil. Like I really was a stunt man and I liked violent sports and things like that. That's why I took judo, right? Probably because I was bullied and I wanted to be able to defend myself. But I remember showing up to those early martial arts courses and I was probably 11, 12 years old that time frame to start. And I just wanted to learn how to punch and be violent. You know, boys just sometimes have that in them. They just want to, they just want to have that outlet. And you're like excited about wanting to learn how to kick and punch. And it's literally like Karate Kid, like Mr. Miyagi was kind of like, slow down, son. Like, we'll get to that. And I remember the first six months just being a rag doll getting tossed around by the other students who had colored belts. I was a white belt, right? They were just tossing me around and throwing me around. I wasn't learning anything. And I was getting frustrated. And I remember him saying that you're not ready to learn how to strike or kick yet, but you need to learn how to fall first. 
So you're here to learn how to fall because most people will get injured when they're falling. You need to learn how to absorb and roll out of that fall. And I'll tell you that just that lesson alone saved me from a lot of injuries from skateboarding and BMX and football later on because we fall down a lot, but I learned how to roll out of it without getting injured. You know, I learned how to absorb that shock. The other thing I learned from martial arts is maintaining your emotional control, right? The calmness, because I really want to illustrate this because a lot of people have really a struggle with maintaining emotional control. And for whatever reason, they think that when you throw a fit of rage or you're road raging at the windshield and you're hawking at the horn and you're shouting obscenities at your own windshield, reflecting back at you and the person that you're yelling at has no clue that you're even there. They're still looking at their phone, wandering around, singing their favorite song. They don't even care what you're doing. But for some reason, that emotional outburst, and my dad did have that. He had a bad temper. I saw that a lot growing up. And I had to say that, do I really want to be like that? Or do I not want to be like that? And I chose not to be like that. But that emotional control is powerful all through your life. And the problem is, is everybody has this knee-jerk reaction. They feel the emotion, but then they go straight into the reaction. And if you have insert a, a moment of awareness between the emotion you feel, which we should feel if we're human, and go, hey, what reaction or how should I react that benefits me best in this situation or aligns with my core values or my character that I want to portray? So when you think about even professional fighters, going back to that, when they're entering the octagon, yeah, there's some like showmanship and there's music playing. And the, but as soon as that bell rings, they both look calm. They look extremely calm and they're getting punched in the face. They're getting kicked, but they're very aware of what their opponent is doing. And they're strategizing in their mind. They're playing defense, but they look calm. They have ultimate emotional control in a very intense situation. We watch movies. We see like the spies and these people like that. They're terrible murderers and are doing some crazy, awful things, but they just look calm. The Navy SEALs, we see the footage of those kind of guys. They're, they're out there doing operations and they're calm. So what it is, is most people wrongly assume that the rage thing, the anger thing is a show of strength. But to someone who is actually strong, we see that as a weakness. If you can't control your emotions, you're actually a, the weakest version of yourself, regardless of how angry you appear. I want to get back to that passion. Mm. Because I started off by asking about, you know, the passion for cars can be turned into a business, yeah. but but also, you know, your passion for helping others has turned into what you do now with the podcast and as a speaker and and uh, as a coach. And so there's this idea of of pursue your passion, pursue your passion, pursue your mm. passion. Mm. How do those of us who are listening, those of us who are maybe you know, they've maybe done that once or twice and they think they've used up all their credits or maybe they're deeper in life and they think, how can, how can I, at this point in my life, you know, I'm, I'm 45, let's say, how can I possibly leave all of this stuff that I've done to go off and pursue my passion? But you were able to do that by turning a passion for auto racing into a multi-million dollar business that you were able to exit and sell. So how do we break this down? It's very common to hear the phrase, follow your passion. But I question myself because I like to deep think, is that really the right way to phrase this? Or is that really the right way to describe what I do? And the answer is no. I think you got to follow your character. And here's how I mean by that. I remember wanting to be a teacher when I was young. I, I wanted to be a teacher because I've always been the educator, the mentor. I, even as a kid, I remember really being fascinated with learning a skateboard trick and just practicing over and over and over and over and just getting bloody and just bruised, but just getting that trick down, maybe a kickflip ollie or just something cool. And then I would master it by just doing repetition, 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 where I got really good at it. But then I couldn't wait to teach other people how to do it. So I've always been the person that was really excited about learning new things, applying those things to become really good or proficient at them. And then the end of it is you're not really successful until there's a succession plan. And so I wanted to teach people and I get excited when I see people trying and learning and transforming. So that was always me. That's my character. Follow your character. I said, well, maybe I should be a teacher or a coach. But then the logic starts to set in and you go, well, what do teachers earn? And then we start to see the numbers that they were earning Less back than then. than engineers at Ford in Detroit. <laughs> yes. And I said, man, that's, that's a tough life. And you know, my mom works in the public schools and like, that's not a lot of money. You know, it's not a lot of money, but here's how you follow your character. 
when you get to college, you start figuring out you're the one that's kind of mentoring other students or coaching them. You're, you're still following that character thing of helping and doing things, whatever your listener, whatever your thing is, like understand that that's your character, right? I get it, those first level engineering jobs and I work a couple of years and then new engineers come in behind me and I would mentor them. Even though that wasn't even my responsibility or even in my job description, I would always volunteer to do that and guide the new people and be willing to help them and get them going. And I did that my entire career. And that's largely a testament of my success is I was able to identify how could I help other people achieve their goals. So I was always a teacher. I was always a mentor following my character of that, regardless of what my profession is. And I think where the mistake is, Mark, is that most people follow a profession based on their passion, but not understanding that their character, the thing that drives them could be applied to any career path. If you passion, want to be a teacher, is passion just a synonym for interest, do you think? Or yeah, like my passion is cars. I don't know why. I think I was born that way. I was running around with Hot Wheels making vroom vroom sounds before I could speak. I just I think we all have a passion. It may be a hobby or just something that you're really fascinated with and you can't wait to learn. Maybe that's it. Make like I used to be that way without coding websites and doing graphic design and photography and playing pool. I've had a lot of passions, a lot of things I was just really excited about. But not all of those are really financial things for a career, but they could be something you're exceptional at. And here's the other thing, like the whole side hustle, yeah, my book title, Side Hustle Millionaire, right? The reason I came out with the premise of that book was because I was looking at these other books that were teaching that stuff, and it was teaching people to think too small. It was teaching people literally to sit at the kitchen table and hand build widgets with glue guns and do these kind of things that would take like an hour of time and you'd make like $15. And they would say, like, you could make $300 extra a month. And I get that's better than zero. But it's like, why are these people teaching people to think so small, like $300 a month? Like, guys, like, go pick up a couple waiting table shifts and go have fun and socialize and make the same amount of money. But it's just, I don't like that people call things side hustles personally, because they put less love or passion or energy in them because they go, oh, that's just a hobby. You know, and if you're doing something and treating it like a hobby, you should only expect hobby results. And I'm not like that. If I go do something and I'm interested in it, and it sounds like you're the same way, we go all in. And you'll find that highly successful people are really good at a lot of things because they do the same thing. They, they may have a hobby of golf or racing cars or weightlifting or whatever, video gaming. But I bet you they're really exceptional at those things too, because they have a different driver inside them. Says, so like, you know what? I want to be really good at this. I'm excited about this. It's not just a hobby. So when people call things a side hustle and a hobby, it's like you're just basically giving yourself permission to not go all in. And I don't like that at all. But you can taste things. You can try things. You can see if it's something you like or don't like. Is, is that not a benefit? That is a benefit, but I also think that people tend to quit too soon. Like one of the things for me, like my brand is 365 driven. It's if you're not willing to go all in for at least one year, I mean, really go all in and give it your best effort, given your resources, your knowledge, your experience, whatever, go all in. And if you don't get the results you want, then maybe you'll understand that in a year. But most people quit two months in. They can go really hard for, like you said, six to eight weeks. Most people can do that for anything that's outside of their norm. And the problem is, is that ego and entitlement start to seep in and they're not getting the response or the reaction or the sales that they feel entitled to because they thought it was going to be easier. And they thought that the audience was just going to show up because they created the podcast or they thought that their social media videos was going to attract a million people to follow them all of a sudden, or maybe they're going to go launch an e-com business and they think that it's going to be six figures in one month because so-and-so did the same kind of business model and he got that result. So I can speak better than him. I could look better than him and my products are better than him. And how come I'm not getting it? So maybe I'm just not cut out for this and I should just give it in and throw in the towel. That's how most people are. The vast majority of people will go really hard for that two months and then there'll be a flash in the pan. They disappear and they Next time you see them months down the road, they're handing you some other type of business card and telling about the newest thing that they're into. I call that the valley. So, you know, I find that whenever you step into something new, you're on a high, you're on a peak. It is super exciting. You're all in on it. You tell people about it. You're evangelizing it. You want everyone to think the way you think. People do this with TV shows and books too. They want you to see it. They want a shared experience. And then you hit kind of the, the, the valley, the down point. I find that if you just push through, you will find yourself working your way up to the next peak. And often that next peak is just slightly higher than the previous peak, mm -hmm. but you have to push through. And so for me, my, my biggest trick is just to change something up. 
Like, how can I make this interesting or exciting again? I do this with exercise. You can lift weights and it can be really challenging and fun. And a few weeks in, it can be a total grind. And it can be like, I've got to lift weights again. I've got to go for a run again. I've got to meet with my accountant again, right? It could be anything. But if you find that it's turning into a grind, you got to just change things up. And so you have done this with, I went through your LinkedIn profile. You've done this career after career, point after point. But you hit 2015 and you were kind of caught off guard. You were kind of surprised. And it really, you shared with me in another conversation that we had that it was a really hard time for you. Walk me through what happened to you at that point in your life. 2015, I was staff at Chevron and we were finishing up a South Africa project offshore. And I'd been on that project for three years. It was a $250 million portfolio that I was managing. A lot of moving parts, a lot of stress, 24-7 operations, had suppliers in Italy, France, England. I was doing a lot of international travel every month. And we were facing an industry downturn. So the last nine months of that job, they had waves of layoffs. And the only reason that my project team was gainfully employed during those waves is because we were near completion of our project. So they knew that we could finish by the end of the year, then they would lay us off. So we kind of knew that the chopping block was coming. But then at the same time, we're watching a lot of their beloved colleagues and really excellent people getting laid off wave after wave. You don't think that really hurts your morale a little bit and knowing that your turn's just up next as soon as you're, you're getting laid off. And I happened to finish one of my last legs. We completed the project and I was in Africa and I flew home to, I flew to Paris at the time to go debrief the, the contractor. And while I was there, I finished a meeting and then my supervisor calls me at eight o'clock at night and says that I need to go turn in my badge and my laptop because my role was complete. I was like, it's 8 p.m. I'm in Paris. She's like, I know I forgot to tell you. I should have told you earlier, but can you go back to the Chevron office and turn all that stuff in? I was like, right now. Yeah, I need you to do that. I was supposed to tell you. It's like, fine. So I had to go get on a subway at 9 p.m. and go back to the Chevron rendezvous. What's going, what's, what's going through your head? I'm it's thinking be a long subway ride. Dude, I was thinking like, this is how you treat somebody that just finished a $250 million project on budget, on schedule, with no incidents. And you couldn't wait for me to get back to Houston to, to do all this. Like it had to be right now, just completely oblivious to the situation. Right. And, and she, this, this lady, the supervisor I had, she had a history of this for that whole three years, just really unaware, terrible leader, just a terrible leader. I'll just put it out there. And so I was already kind of having to lay off part of my own team and, and dealing with that and all the stress. And I was like, you know what? I don't know if I want to be involved in this industry anymore. I was surrounded by a bunch of people who are not willing to take risks or do things that make a name for themselves. They just want to be status quo, don't rock the boat, play safe. And they would just hover there at that $200,000 a year mark for the rest of their careers. And they would take a big pension home and they retire. That's all they want to do at that level. I said, that's not who I want to be. I want to be the CEO of this company. Like I, I will be willing to take risks and make a name for myself to go win for you guys. And that's who I am. And so it didn't align with me anymore. And there was a downturn and I got laid off. And a month later, I was racing cars and I was in a near-death experience that kind of compounded this thing. I was at what a track. Happened? Man, I was at the drag strip here in Houston and there was a, a shop and a manufacturer there with a test car, a Dodge Viper twin turbo, thousand horsepower. And they were trying to get a, a nine second pass out of it. And they were having a hard time launching the car. They didn't have a lot of experience behind the wheel. And I have one of those, another car, about 1200 horsepower Dodge Viper. And they knew that I had a lot of records and they said, Hey, do you mind piloting this car in the last pass? We're going to do a Hail Mary pass. The track's about to close. I said, fine. And they put on a new set of tires and the track was largely empty and I was by myself on the lane. Thank God. And about the top of third gear, something in the rear suspension broke. And I didn't understand why the car was pulling right. And I was trying to keep it off that wall. And it finally started grazing that wall on the right. And I was like, man, if that's the worst of it, I guess the, the past didn't happen. Let me just start getting on the brakes, right? It's over. And as I was getting on the brakes and coming off that wall, the right rear wheel kicked out like a pushing a shopping cart backwards kind of scenario. So it was doing the steering for me. So I'm steering straight. The car goes hard left. And I'm looking at the concrete Jersey barriers and the other lane approaching them at 130 miles per hour. And in that moment, I really thought I was going to die. And I said, even to myself, well, here I go. 
And of course, the impact happens, the airbags deploy, the car is just coming to pieces. I can just, I'm not understanding if I'm injured or anything. I just remember being conscious and that I had to get out of that car because most people can survive an impact, but they can't survive the flames because you got to realize like gasoline, oil, brake fluid, transmission fluid, every single fluid in a car is flammable. It takes one spark to your fireball. And I just remember I'm awake, stay awake, stay awake, get out of the car, get out of the car. And the car was sliding forever and I just terrible noises. It was black and smoke of airbags in there and came to a rest. I pried the door open and I got out of the car and I'm looking at, and there's wheels off the car. Every single panel in this car is damaged. And I'm just standing there. I took my helmet off and I could hear my friend sprinting up the quarter mile. I could hear the ambulance approaching. I, I just, I could hear all the noises and I'm just looking at this wreckage and they put me in the back of the ambulance and the paramedics inspecting me and checking my heart rate and the vitals and asking me if I'm injured. And she's asking me a bunch of questions to see if I have a concussion. And I told you, I'm very calm just like I am right now. And I'm looking at the wreckage sitting in the back of this ambulance, just looking at it. And she says, do you mind, you know, if I tell you like, you know, what's going on? I was like, oh crap, here it goes. You know, uh, maybe I'm injured and I don't know about it, but she tells me, she goes, you're just remarkably calm. She goes, people crash out here all the time and you don't have the adrenaline shakes. You don't have the shortness of breath. Your heart rate's normal. Like you're very calm. I was like, I am calm. And it took me a few days to understand why. And the reason that I thought that is because I thought I was really going to die in that moment. And I was really peaceful in that moment. I didn't have any fear. And then I started thinking a series of questions while I was sitting in the back of the ambulance. It was, you know, why am I still here? And then the next question logically becomes, well, had I died, how would I have been remembered? If I would have died right there, how would I have been remembered? And you sit with that one for a while. You start looking at people that you know that have passed away, maybe in the same circles. And you go, well, how is so-and-so remembered? And after doing that few iterations, I started realizing, okay, I got a pretty good idea of how it have been remembered. And it would have been nice, rich guy, cool car is gone too soon. And I said, okay, nice, rich guy, cool car is gone too soon. Is that, is that good enough? Is that good enough for someone that's a high performer, someone that really wants to do things and make impact? Is that really good enough? So that became my idea is like, I need to go create more impact. I didn't know what that meant at the time. I need to go create impact in this world. I need to go do something. And then I also started to combine the realization that I faced what I thought was certain death and I had no fear. I was peaceful in that moment. It's really profound. So I combined the two and I said, if I don't even fear death, literally, if I don't fear death, then death can't be so bad. So why not just go do it and go all that and just just make some noise and actually go create that impact. And it took me two more years to launch my brand and really understand what that meant to me, because that's a soul searching life meaning type question that most of us don't know how to answer to. And it took me two more years and I didn't work. I picked up some gigs and built some things. And I still owned a few businesses with online e-com and drop shipping. So I was making enough money to pay the bills. And I was just kind of figuring out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And that's when I launched my brand, which was May of 2017, I launched 365 Driven to coach people and help people with business and find confidence. And so how do you, knowing what you've known and knowing how far you've come, how do you look and plan your future? You know, you talked about who do I need to be? Who do I need to be over the next few years? What do I, what's the vision board? You know, your mother helped just instill this into you. So what do, are you doing today to help you become whomever you need to be in the future? I think that that's a big question I've actually been pondering at the beginning of this year because it's a good time to kind of do the forward forecasting. And if someone were to ask me today, and it may change again, I'm okay with uncertainty and I embrace that things can change. I want to be the best business coach that there ever was. And I know that I'll get there because I'm heart centered and I have the results and I'll keep doing that. My clients love the way I work with them. And for me, it's just I want to make sure that my message gets broadcast and amplified enough to reach enough people that. That becomes who I am. And I see this happening. It's not how do you know if you're winning or losing at that? That's a very yeah, I mean, I'm not asking you for KPIs and all of these things or a three, you know, a three year uh, plan, but but how do you know if you're becoming the best business coach or not? I think just looking at industry recognition, if you ask most people who the number one coach is, we'd all say Tony Robbins. So there's a defined version of different types of coaching, whatever that is to you. He's a life coach, right? To me, yeah, it's a lot of subjectivity, but maybe, like you said, there are some KPIs or measurables that can get there. But to me, it's like the impact that you create, right? I'm honored that I've got 20 years of business ownership out there. And I would say, hey, go Google me, look me up. There is not a single complaint 
Not one, not one negative review in 20 years of business ownership, multiple seven figure businesses. And it's because of my character. I'm willing to do what it takes to make, make things right. You've, you've just red, red flagged all the trolls <laughs> who are going to go and just leave you fake reviews now. There you go. Hey, you know what? People that work with me know the truth. Last question for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to then? I'm trying to change the generational legacy of millions of people by not only impacting them on a personal level, but it's going to impact their children, their grandchildren, the generations that follow them. So I used to say thousands of people because I was unsure, just I'm a normal human. When we write a book or do something like that, we say, hey, I want to impact a thousand people. We kind of have a question the way we answer that. I sold a thousand copies of my book the first week and I was like, oh, crap. Maybe I should say impact 10,000. No, that sounds cheesy. 100,000. That sounds cheesy. I guess I got to go millions. And even then, when you start to say that initially, you don't believe it because it sounds like a pretty big jump. And it is. And you had to grow into that and become the right character to be able to sell that and carry that story. So I had to do a lot of investing in myself to be able to get on these microphones or on stages or TV and things that I do now. I had to invest to become the right person to, to carry the story, but I envisioned who I was going to become years ago. And I try to make those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that are leading me closer to that version of myself. So what's next is just amplifying the message, doing the things that are going to re be required and being really honest with myself. Like, am I willing to do that work? And sometimes the answer is no, I'm not perfect, but I'm going to keep pushing and keep trying. And that's the thing is I just want to impact people. And the best way I'm going to do that is teaching them confidence and business principles, things I've uniquely designed and love and have passion for. That's how I'm going to impact the world. Beep.